So I will shortly introduce the speakers of this uh, afternoon panel and I recommend uh, to this great audience that you are um, to listen carefully to them because these are the speakers of the next uh, economic superpower, Africa, which is developing at a high rate thanks to Chinese uh, help. And this panel today is aimed also at provoking Europe to join this effort. Otherwise, Europe uh, in this present state of decadence will shall, shall resign to become just a tourist place for being visited by rich African <laughs> entrepreneurs <laughs> tomorrow. So, um, as first speaker, we will have uh, my colleague Hussein Askari, who is the coordinator for Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia of the Schiller Institute. Um, and uh, a second speaker, we will have uh, uh, Mr. Wang Hao, who was supposed to uh, be here tomorrow, but he cannot be tomorrow, so he will speak today, but it fits anyway into the panel, I believe. And uh, Mr. Wang Hao is uh, a representative of the uh, Chinese Embassy of uh, the People's Republic of China to the Federal Republic of Germany. He is the first secretary for economic economy and trade. Uh, then we will have uh, His Excellency Yusuf Maitama Tuggar, the ambassador of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria to Germany. And he will be followed by, uh, he will speak on the vision of Nigeria for Nigeria and Africa as well. Um, then we will have uh, um, my friend Mohamed Bila, who is the expert modeler of the Lake Chad Basin Observatory, the Lake Chad Basin Commission, and he will uh, uh, update you on the state of things uh, concerning the great water transfer and infrastructure project called Transaqua, the impact of Transaqua on the future development of Africa. Uh, then we will have, oh, I forgot to call Mr. Uh, Bukhari Yabara, but I think he is here. Uh, he's a, uh, an African historian, he's a general, general secretary of the Pan-African League, Umoya, and he will speak on what pan what Pan-Africanism on the Silk Road. Uh, and uh, the panel will be concluded then uh, by uh, one uh, other remark by my colleague uh, Hussein Askari on opera Operation Felix. Yemen's reconstruction and connection to the Belt and Road. Um, after this uh, panel, we will call from the floor on a representative of the Yemeni Association in Center for Human Rights and Peace. So uh, that said, let's um, then begin. And Hussein, please, you can take the microphone. Thank you very much, Claudio. I'm uh, pleased and honored to uh, be opening this esteemed and very interesting panel. Uh, my name is Hussein Askari. I'm, the, I'm an Iraqi Swedish citizen. Uh, been, I'm the Southwest Asia coordinator for the Schiller Institute. I've been working with the Schiller Institute for the last uh, 23 years. Uh, I'm also the co-author of the special report. Uh, if you have the next uh, slide. Uh, Extending the New Silk Road to West Asia and Africa, uh, which was released here last year in a conference in this, uh, uh, this place. Yeah, it was released in November 2017, last year here in this, in this uh, same place. Um, this report, which we have copies of, everybody should get a copy, uh, is um, a wonderful expression of the optimism that has been sparked by Africa's joining the new paradigm defined the, by the Belt and Road Initiative of 2013, presented by China, and the BRICS Nations Fortaleza Declaration of 2014. Most African nations are working intensively now on real development plans with China and these other nations of the BRICS and their friends. Uh, this report is also a roadmap for the bright future that is awaiting the coming generations of Africans and the people of Southwest Asia, so-called Middle East. Middle East is the wrong term. It's called Southwest Asia. Oh, yeah. okay. That's it. Yeah, this is a 
the, to the left we have Africa, a true image of Africa by night taken by NASA satellites. And you see the, a continent shrouded in darkness because there is no, simply there is no electricity. The image to the left is uh, an image which uh, was drawn after my instructions by our friend and member, uh, Chance McGee, of how we envision Africa to look like by night, by 2050. By 2030, Southwest Asia and Africa will have jointly contributed the greatest population growth uh, out of all world regions, reaching 1.9 billion in 2030, with an amazing median age of only 23 years. By 2050, the bulk of the world's population growth will take place in Africa. Of the additional 2.4 billion people projected to be born between 2015 and 2050, 1.3 billion will be added in Africa. While people who have been brainwashed by British propaganda believe this is a catastrophe and a problem, we believe this is a fantastic challenge and a great opportunity. And I think this is the same view that China holds of Africa. If we listen to speeches by President Xi Jinping in the China-Africa summits, he sees Africa as a great opportunity. What is required, as Helga said this morning, is that to get to the new paradigm, for Europe to, to join the new paradigm, it's not only that they will participate in building railways in Africa, we have to change our view of humans and our attitudes, for example, towards Africa. Because Africa is, in European minds and in the US, is associated with problems. Because that's the only thing being reported. So instead, we have to get a change in the mind of the European policymakers and in the population and in the United States that Africa is not a problem. Africa is a great challenge, but it's a great opportunity. And I think this is the lesson we are learning from China's involvement in Africa. Uh, some of the projects described in this report, can, you can help me, just take next. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna describe this report in detail because I did that last year and people should get a copy of the report. Can you have the next slide? The, the Pan-African Railway. Um, uh, uh, some of the projects described in this report are already completed, uh, under construction, or being negotiated seriously. As some of our honorable speakers will um, uh, identify, uh, there, there are, there's enormous progress that's taking place. At least one nation in Africa, Ethiopia, is now nicknamed a double-digit growth nation, and many others uh, will soon join the club. But there are no limits to what can be achieved in this wonderful continent, and therefore our level of ambition and visions and our plans have to be at the same level as the challenge itself. This is a map of the Trans-African High-Speed Railway we envision, but this plan exist, has existed in the African Union for many, many years, but it represents the highway uh, for roads in Africa, but it has never been built. But now it's being... Um, um, is now being uh, uh, developed piece by piece. If we look at the next slide. The next. Okay. okay. Uh, because we have like the, the, the Djibouti Addis Ababa Railway uh, was uh, co co completed in 2017 with the help of uh, 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 China. We have the Mombasa Nairobi Railway, which was also completed last year. And these, all these uh, projects are, are breaking all previous records on the construction, the speed, the efficiency, and the cost. So these are some of the, the projects, and I'm not gonna go through uh, more projects, but that finally what the African Union has been dreaming uh, and planning, now it's being implemented on the ground. So the, the, um, the, the proverbial shuffle is already in the ground. So this is not something in, which is coming in the future. So our panel, which is titled How the Belt and Road Initiative is Changing Africa, the only humane solution to the refugee crisis, could not come together in a more crucial time than this, as the old paradigm unfortunately continues to wreak havoc in many nations, like in Syria and in Yemen, and the consequences of at least 40 years of misguided and intentionally destructive policies imposed on these nations are still being felt through widespread poverty, 
epidemics, food shortage, and lack of basic services, and also the uh, mass refugee crisis. I myself was a refugee and suffered with my family enormously when we uh, had to flee Iraq. The next image. Uh, in 1991, uh, from the Kurdish city in Iraq uh, 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 of Sulaymaniyah, uh, as a consequence of the Gulf War or the uh, Desert Storm, which uh, Colonel Schutz was talking about, and uh, uh, with, which was launched by George Bush Sr. Um, and we had to walk, my family and I, we had to walk for six days and nights in very harsh uh, mountain climate, where it's raining and even snowing some cases, and we had nothing with us uh, except for small bags of dried uh, fruit um, until we reached the, um, the Iranian border, and then we ended up in huge tent camps uh, in, uh, in Iran. Um, uh, I myself was, I, I finally, um, uh, when we reached these refugee camps, this was a terrible situation and the morale and the, even the physical conditions were terrible, but we managed to dust the, our clothes and rise, my family and I, my sisters uh, especially, and we started working with the international aid organizations, the Red Cross, the Doctors Without Borders, but uh, one year later I managed to come to Norway. Uh, and I even have been um, the key character in a documentary film in broadcast in Norway in 1994 about the refugee crisis. You can see in the next image. The, the, it's a documentary series which is called Sightseeing in Reality. Uh, one of the luckies, the luck, one of the lucky, uh, which is myself. I was 23 years at the time. Um, and as Helga says, uh, said today, is that you know, when you look at refugees, they are not objects on the TV screen. When you look at refugees, they are real human beings. Many of them have aspirations. They have a mission in their life. And they are just not a number. Um, but two years later, after I reached uh, Norway in 1992, uh, I met the Schiller Institute in Oslo. So I have first-hand sense of what it means to suffer as a refugee and to leave everything behind and risk your life to get where you believe is a safer place or where you can live with dignity. However, I was convinced that the solution to all the many refugee crises was not by relieving the symptoms, by simply providing aid to the refugees, which should be done anyway, you should help refugees, uh, uh, but by dealing with the causes of all these crises at the core. That could and will only be dealt with through creating a new and just world economic order and political order. So it was all the very natural for me to join the Schiller Institute already in 1994 and dedicate my time and energy to contribute to creating this new paradigm with Helga and Lyndon LaRouche and all the wonderful people I have met uh, and worked with all these years. I have the next image. So whether you are a refugee, a native, a citizen, uh, a resident of Europe or the United States or anywhere, you should join the Schiller Institute because this is the only way, as I have experienced, to make a, a change in the world which has an impact on every living being on the planet. So now we are many. Uh, we are, have whole nations also uh, joining the new paradigm, and we can all see that the prospects of a prosperous and beautiful future for all nations is within reach. Therefore, I, I urge every one of you that in the midst of the worst suffering, we always have to have our eyes not on the mud under our feet, but direct our eyes toward the bright stars above. Thank you very much. I call on his, uh, Mr. Wang Hao. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited to attend today's meeting. 
First of all, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Schiller Institute, who have put a lot of effort and uh, passion in German, we say Leidenschaft, uh, in organizing today's conference. Uh, my topic is a role for Europe in the Bed and Road Initiative. Uh, this is a topic uh, which the organizers g gave me. I found it difficult, but meaningful one. Difficult because as a diplomat, it is hard for me to tell how Europe should engage in the Belt and Road Initiative. But on the other hand, it is meaningful that as the largest trade partner of China, European Union should participate in this initiative. European entrepreneurs have also shown their interest. So today, I would like to have a discussion with you regarding this topic. First, I would like to share with you why China puts forward Bed and Road Initiative. The spirit of the Silk Road was connectivity of different peoples. In the age of globalization, this spirit still has its meaning. One of the preconditions to connect people is infrastructure, such as road and railway. China has learned from its experience how important transport facilities are for the development of economy. I would like to tell you a story of my own. When I was a kid, I often went to see my grandparent who lived in the province capital, which is less than 200 kilometers away. But the travel took almost a whole day due to the bad road conditions at that time. It was not only a waste of time, but also reflected the efficiency of the economy. Nowadays, the two cities are connected by a highway, just like most other Chinese cities. And the journey takes less than two hours. We Chinese have a saying, to get rich, you must build the road first. So today, China is the second largest economy of the world. And building an advanced infrastructure network has had an important contribution to that. Presently, China has 136,000 kilometers of highway and 25 thousand kilometers of high-speed railway, which accounts for two-thirds of the world's total. Seven of the ten biggest seaports worldwide are located in China. Both passenger and cargo aviation are rapidly developing in China. All of these have changed people's lives as well as laying a solid foundation for the rapid development of China's economy. In the age of globalization, there are still many places around the world which are, under, which are underdeveloped and lacking the basic infrastructure. The needs in this area are enormous. According to Asian Development Bank, Asia alone will need to invest 1.000 trillion US dollars every year from 2017 to 2030 in infrastructure in order to maintain its growth momentum. As you might know, that facilities connectivity is one of the five priorities of the Bed and the Road Initiative. Here, facilities refer not only to transport facilities, but also include oil and gas pipelines, grease, and cross-border cable construction. The aim is to expand road and rail links, eliminate traffic bottleneck, bottlenecks to facilitate international transport and trade, improvement of port and aviation infrastructure, oil and gas pipelines, grids and cable work networks. We believe that proper transportation infrastructure is the basis of economic development. That is one of the reasons why China puts forward the Bed and Road Initiative. I would like to emphasize here that the Bed and the Road is not a strategy, but an initiative. Every nation can participate and benefit from it. The Bed and the Road Initiative is a public good that China offers to the world. It is a fast train to prosperity, 
that is ready to take everybody along. It's also a massive long-term project, not just for short-term profit. China is a country with limited resources and capabilities, who depends on the active participation of other partners, including Germany and Europe. Here is how Europe can make contribution and benefit from. Actually, 19 European countries, including Germany, Great Britain, and France, are members of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which provides solid financial support for the Silk Road Initiative. Germany is represented as the largest non-regional partner in AIIB. Deutsche Bank belongs to the first group of non-regional financial service providers for the Silk Road Initiative. The European companies can also, can also participate in the project in the framework of the Bed and Road Initiative with their technology, capital, product, and know-how. I would like to emphasize that in order to participate in this initiative, European enterprises should make their own effort instead of waiting for the project to come to them. They should look for the opportunities themselves. In this area, the Chamber of Commerce of Europe in the countries along the route can play an important role. Ladies and gentlemen, by cooperation along the road, the bed and the road, China and Europe can both benefit economically and give the states along the route an improvement in both economic development and the living conditions, which will further provide new opportunities for business and improve Europe's internal and external security. We already have some visible achievement such as the more than 3,000 flight trains that operated between China and Europe in 2017. 48 of them are actually between China and Germany. The flight train has become a symbol of the initiative in Europe. Duisburg and Hamburg are two important destinations in Europe and have benefited a lot from it. Other cities such as Mannheim, Rostock and Bremen have also shown great interest of operating flight train. We encourage more European companies to use the flight train to export their goods to China and other Asian, city, Asian countries in order to save time and lower cost. Last but not least, I sincerely hope that Europe and China will go along with the trend of the times engage in an open and win-win cooperation, embrace reform and innovation, and seize the historical opportunity of the Bed and the Road Initiative. Uh, at, at, at the end, I have to apologize for leaving earlier and cannot participate in the panel discussion, which I will, I'm very eager to, but uh, I have my colleague and I have to catch the train to go back to Berlin because our prime minister will visit uh, Germany in a week. So there are a lot of work waits for us. So, so I wish the conference a great success and uh, wish everybody, all of you, a nice day. Thank you. Now I invite His Excellency Yusuf Maitama Tugga, the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, to the microphone. Thank you very much. Let me begin by commending the organizers, um, Schiller Institute, for hosting uh, such a conference, uh, which um, seeks to discuss something that um, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and uh, me in particular uh, hold dear to our hearts, which is the um, 
inter-basin water transfer between the Congo Basin to the Lake Chad uh, Basin. Now, when I was first invited, um, I was invited to a panel discussion. So I focused on simply, you know, having a discussion. But, uh, and, and the topic uh, was meant to be uh, after the trans aqua breakthrough, Nigeria comes to the fore. So, um, but I decided instead of preparing a speech to just stick to my discussion, which is what I'm going to do while I stand here. So I hope you, uh, you will not mind that. The interbasin water transfer, like I said, seeks to transfer um, about 100 million cubic meters of water per year from the Congo Basin uh, to the Lake Chad uh, Basin, and in particular to uh, the Lake Chad itself that has been shrinking um, over the years. Uh, it's been the subject of uh, international discussion because it uh, underscores what most of us are, are concerned about, which is uh, climate change, desertification, uh, conflict, because it happens to be um, in the Sahel region and the, the Lake Chad is, the, the Lake Chad Basin area in, in particular is an area where a lot of these issues are coming together. So it's the nexus for uh, conflict, for migration, for um, hydrocarbon exploration because oil has been discovered, oil and gas has been discovered in Niger Republic, in Chad, there are pipelines being built, uh, and of course everybody knows about the, uh, the Boko Haram conflict that, that was going on there. Thank God it's been surmounted um, by the requisite collaboration between um, African countries because the region also happens to be in one of the most complex cross-border areas in Africa, if not the most conflict, uh, complex, where four countries meet, Niger, Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria. And one of the reasons why there was uh, a lag or delay in tackling the Boko Haram um, uh, problem was because um, there was a failure to define it the way it is, which is a cross-border uh, conflict, and to use the collaboration of the countries in the region uh, to solve the problem. Uh, now, this um, thankfully changed when the current president, Muhammadu Buhari, um, was sworn in in 2015, because five days after his swearing in, he embarked on a visit to Niger, to Cameroon, to Chad, and essentially he was saying, look guys, we have to come together, we have to um, um, collaborate and uh, solve this problem. Now this was no fluke, because he happened to also be um, a former governor of Borno State, which was ground zero for this conflict. So he, he understood the, the region very well, and he knew that historically, going back, uh, to tackle such problems, if it was uh, Rabe bin Zubair in 1897 or Bukhar Amadidi in, uh, 19, uh, in the 1940s, you needed the collaboration of the countries. And there's always been, at least since 1964, there's always been an organ to tackle these sort of uh, problems. Uh, the water transfer, um, issue is being handled or is being spearheaded at the moment by the Lake Chad Basin Commission. Thank God the foremost expert um, on this uh, water transfer happens to be part of the panel. Uh, so I was happy to see his name there, uh, Mr. Mohammed Bila. In fact, truth be told, he ought to have spoken before me so that I can just uh, cruise after that. But be that as it may, um, I will do my best, but the technical details, the more 
you know, the deeper insights to what is to be achieved, I'm sure he will explain. I don't want us to, um, to look at uh, this project or indeed other developmental projects that are going on in Africa and in Nigeria in particular through um, the binary lens of, um, of, of, of China versus Europe. You know, that sort of binary um, approach uh, which perhaps is some sort of Cold War lag, where we think if China is playing, then Europe uh, is out, or if Europe is playing, then China is out. We need the cooperation, the collaboration of all three, because it's not just China and, uh, and Europe either. Africa is also on the table, and uh, there's a need to ensure that Africa is always represented and is part of the discussion that develops any solutions, be they um, infrastructure, development, what have you, migration, Africa needs to be a part of it. Um, and one of the reasons why with the Lake Chad um, issue we need the full collaboration and participation of, of Europe and not just China, um, because this, yes, would be part of uh, the One Road, One Belt in, uh, initiative which sits in perfectly with uh, the concept of globalization, you know, because it's about interconnectivity. We change the way we look at the world, and this is what has happened over the course of human history. Uh, we have to redefine the map of the world or the, ex or, 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 or the part of the world that we know um, before we even discovered that the whole world was a globe. You know, so we've gone from Terra Rogeriana you know, the Idrisia map that is actually upside down. You know, it's, uh, he looks at it differently. So we also need to start looking at um, globalization, that connectivity. Uh, we need to perhaps maybe lay more emphasis on maps that highlight um, uh, infrastructure uh, lines, rail lines, um, transmission lines for electricity, uh, roads, and so on and so forth, uh, as opposed to um, a more sort of a Halford Mackinder type approach, which is, uh, you know, to have a, a Eurasian um, world island, and then everything else beyond that is a rimland, it's a shatter belt, it's all of that. So we need that collaboration, and we, we, the only way you can achieve these sort of uh, developmental and uh, in infrastructure uh, leapfrogging initiatives in Africa is when you utilize the existing knowledge, the existing database. And this is where Europe uh, has a critical role to play, because I have to say that um, uh, it is uh, rather, you know, for me, it's perhaps kismet that we happen to be uh, holding this gathering in uh, no lesser place than Germany, because the first um, or the earliest, some of the earliest uh, irregular migrants that uh, we received in the Lake Chad Basin area happened to be uh, from Germany. It was Heinrich Bath in the 1850s. It was um, uh, Gustav Nachtigall. It was his nephew, um, uh, I forget his name now, a priest, um, who did a lot of extensive studies of the flora and fauna uh, and much more, the culture of the Lake Chad area. So uh, perhaps there's even a need to uh, to tap into all that knowledge and, uh, and data that was gathered to be able to transfer huge volumes of water from the Lake Chad, uh, from the uh, Congo Basin uh, to the Lake Chad, which would completely transform uh, uh, the sub-region, if not the entire continent, because uh, with such a feat, you would generate uh, electricity, you would, um, um, 
provide water for irrigation, you would uh, provide trans transportation, um, fishing activities, so much. Work, uh, work would be provided for, for the teeming youth that are always looking to make that uh, desert uh, crossing. Uh, so the issue of uh, irregular migration uh, would also be touched on uh, by such a project. Now, quite a bit of ground has been covered because um, I remember when uh, the president of Nigeria was sworn in uh, shortly after that, I went and had a meeting with him and I was emphasizing the need um, for the current administration to, um, to uh, make progress on the, uh, the water transfer. And um, I was talking to him about the, the 90s when the, you know, some of these efforts were initiated and uh, 2001, uh, sorry, 2000, when on the legislative side in Nigeria, there was uh, a committee that was created and um, there was, uh, it was meant to be a, a, a regional uh, committee uh, for the Lake Chad to tackle you know, some of the funding issues, some of the uh, sensitization issues. So each country uh, that was, a, uh, you know, the member countries of the Lake Chad Basin Commission would have two legislators representing it. But he told me that, uh, look, this, I became involved in this and, you know, took up interest in this in the 70s when he was petroleum minister, when he flew with the uh, uh, president then, Obasanjo, and the foreign affairs minister, Joe Garba, to meet with Ahmadu Ahijo in uh, Cameroon. So you see, it goes all the way back. It's uh, something that, uh, that needs to be done. And these are the sort of transformative um, um, uh, projects that we need to be able to um, achieve what we keep mentioning, sustainable development. Sustainable development is not going to be achieved by simply listing goals. Um, we need to identify these sort of um, transformative projects to fund them, support them, see them to fruition. And the only way we'll be able to achieve that is if we all put our hands uh, together, hands and heads. So it's China, it's Europe, it's Africa. I don't know how long I have to speak, so I will uh, um, stop here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So, and uh, now it's up to you, Mohammed, to go to the microphone. Mohammed Bila, we have known uh, each other for three years now, and uh, he's also a Nigerian. Nigeria now, don't think that Nigeria is overrepresented here because, <laughs> because he represents eight countries of the Lake Chad Basin Committee. So, please. Uh, thank you, Claudio. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Lecture Basin Commission is delighted to be given this opportunity to interact with the Schiller Institute. Uh, I have to give the apologies of the Executive Secretary due to some constraint he cannot come. That is why he sent me to portray the viewpoints of the Lecture Basin Commission uh, to the participants of this conference. I am a modeler in the Lecture Basin Commission. I have been there since 2002. So all the developments that have been going on, uh, even before 2002, within Nigeria, I have seen the impact on the drying of the lecture. I have seen the attempts made by the different governments to solve the problem. I have seen the support that the international community has been giving to the lecture basin and the member states. But 
as of 2012, we had a totally different new challenge. That is an open conflict by people who feel they must change everybody. And uh, this problem, if we had looked for a solution 30 years ago, probably we wouldn't have been in this state. Uh, the Congo Lecture Basin Interbasin Water Transfer became a solution to the drying of the lecture problem when the eighth summit of head of state and government of the lecture Basin Commission held in Abuja in March 1994 launched the international campaign to save the lecture. The election of President Muhammad Buhari in 2015 and his appeal to the international community to help in recharging the lecture to revive the economic activities and reduce ter terrorism, the LCVC decided to look at one of the oldest proposal we had, which was called the trans Aqua proposal. The proposal was developed in the 1980s as a comprehensive solution against the Sahel drought that was recurring. It started in 73, but in the 1980s, we also had this drought. In March 2018, under the leadership of President Buhari, eight African heads of state and government came to attend the international conference to save the lecture in Abuja. Those eight heads of state, based on the proceedings and discussions in the workshop, endorse the Trans Aqua project as the most viable option to save the lecture, but also to transform Africa. And uh, in, in this meeting, we have the head of state from the LCVC countries, uh, five of them, and then we have a representative from the government of Libya, and then we have uh, Ali Bongo of the Central African Republic of uh, Gabon. He was there. And we also had uh, the confirmation, the affirmation of the uh, proceedings of the conference by Dennis Sasso, in Google, uh, the president of Congo Brazzaville. He called Muhammad Yusuf during the conference and said, I gave all my blessing to whatever came out of this conference. So this was the first time the African leaders came together and tried to look for a common solution that will uh, save the problem. The Transaqua proposal consists of a 2,400 kilometer waterway transferring between 30 to 50 billion cubic meters. The initial proposal that was done in the 80s by the Italian engineer, Marcelo Vicky, thought we could get 100,000 billion cubic meters and move it to the lake chart. But from then on to now, we have been having this consistent drought. So the general thinking is that we might not get 100 billion cubic meters but we can get between 30 to 50 billion cubic meters. Taking from the right side tributaries of the Congo River to the Lake Chad, the project is expected to directly bring economic development to seven African countries and indirect benefits to five more countries associated with the Congo and the Lake Chad basins. At the end of the conference, there was the Abuja Declaration uh, the Abuja Declaration was endorsed by the head of state, and the head of state noted that the consequences of the drying up of the lecture and the loss of the source of livelihood in the, Sahel, in the Sahel is affecting human security through southward migration and conflict towards Central Africa and Congo, insecurity of lives and property in the Sahel, and the lecture region, 
and West Africa in general, as well as negating the stability of Central Africa in the long term. So this is a gradual thing. Since two, uh, 1973, those who have assets, that is those who have cattle, they have been moving away from the Sahel. They have been going towards the center of Africa. That is where the green is grass. They are trying to protect the assets, the little asset they have, by moving southward. This migration is taking them to a new region where they meet people with different cultures, with different languages, and this is what cause, is the main cause of the problem in the Central African Republic. So we have concluded that if we don't reverse this situation, this southward migration within Africa will cause more problem in the regions that are already experiencing internal conflict. And also, this uh, loss of livelihood is causing the young in the Sahel region to move up north through Libya to Europe. So the Abuja Declaration endorsed the Trans Aqua Interpersonal Water Initiative as a Pan-African project necessary to restore the Lekchat for peace and security in the Lekchat region and for the promotion of navigation, industrial and economic development in the whole Congo Basin. The African Development Bank was mandated to facilitate the creation of the Lekchat Fund of 50 billion US dollars. The funding sources shall include social component funded through public sources from African states and also the economic component funded using public funds and loans and donations by development partners. Uh, I have uh, some few slides. This is the picture of the Transaqua. Uh, these are the links that are trying to create the infrastructure for Africa. The blue within the center is the trans water navigation canal that will st start in the south of the Lake Victoria area, Lake Kivu region, that goes along the crest by gravity reaching uh, the Central African Republic where we expect to develop an industrial zone and this water will be uh, dropped into the Chari River that will gradually recharge the lake chart. So that I want to show the picture of uh, the meeting, the international conference. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So these are the regions that will be impacted by this Transaqua project. You can see the first beneficiary will be the Democratic Republic of Congo because the water will be generated from that basin and we need new concepts in describing what is happening. The traditional concept is you take water and allocate it to a country or to a group of users. But with the new concept of having benefit sharing, win-win situation, we cannot go with the traditional concept. So here we foresee a certain 
stock of water, which has one value, taken from the Congo River, moving along the canal, it's adding value in transportation of goods, it's adding value by recreation of that canal. This water goes into the Central African Republic. When this stock of water moves, dams will be created. We have identified that uh, at the tributaries, dams will be created. These dams will generate electricity. So this is another added value from this stock of water. And then when it moves to Central African Republic, the hydroelectricity could be used and the water could be used in developing irrigation. This same stock of water will move into the Lake Chad Basin across the divide. Cameroon can use the water for irrigation. The electricity already generated can be shared by Cameroon, can be shared by Central uh, Chad, because these are all regions that we don't have electricity. So these are all the benefits that comes out from this project. Uh, eventually, this water will go into the Lake Chad. Niger is going to benefit in irrigation. And also, whatever they want to develop the water for. So this is a big opportunity for movement of goods and services from Central Africa to the Sahel, from the new irrigation projects. Instead of Africa importing billions of tons of rice every year, this project is capable of generating that quantity of rice within Africa. The industrial areas, the terminal, uh, container terminals that will be set up along this navigable canal will bring in new economic development. So, this stock of water will also revive biodiversity, most especially in the Congo Basin where they have large protected areas, parks. Added when you bring in more water to those areas, you enhance the multiplication of biodiversity in those protected areas. So this project is not only uh, developing Africa, but will also help us in reviving biodiversity, protecting it in Central African Republic, and at the same time also reviving biodiversity in the Lake Chat. It will uh, boost regional trade, create new economic infrastructures such as river ports, container terminals, agro-industrial zones, and new roads. These are areas where you don't have roads. In the, in the DRC, if you move from one, con one town to the other, if it is not on the Congo River, it's a hell of challenge for the people. They have to go either on bicycle or motorcycle. These projects will definitely build new roads. In a simulation of what we need, because uh, the company that we have been working with the LCBC, the Bonifica group of Italy, they make a simulation. The project doesn't need to be implemented at once. Their simulation says we can break it down into up to 12 different phases. From the first lot, you can generate economic goods and this money you generate can go into the next phase of the next lot. So gradually, the African countries will even have the capacity to plan it in such a way that they can call 
which who, whoever partners they want to participate in developing the different lots. So the simulation sets generating financial results immediately when you start the first one is capable of providing stable growth for the next 30 years. The expected duration to really complete the project. So you have constant uh, inflow of capital, constant financial result, which is taken into the next lot of the project. So gradually, the project will attain financial uh, sustainability right from the beginning. The first lot which they have simulated is building a dam in the Central African Republic capable of generating 200 megawatt of hydroelectricity in the Central African Republic, development of four irrigation systems covering an area of more than 40,000 hectares, construction of up to 600 kilometers of roads, several new urban settlements, and an industrial and logistical complex with the creation of at least 20,000 direct employment and approximately the same number of indirect employment. This is just based on an investment of 4 billion euros. And this result we can achieve it by 2025. So if I can go back to uh, the question, looking ahead, will Africa become the next China? Yes. If we do this investment, we started by Central African Republic, and we go ahead in the next 50 years, this partnership between Africa, Europe, and China. China, in 2016, pledged to President Mohamed, Mohamed Buhari to invest in this project. They were the first people who started the feasibility study to do it. And later on, we were so happy when Italy decided to join. During the conference in Abuja, Italy donated uh, 2.5 million euros to the feasibility study of this project. So we have China already that has invested 1.8 million dollars and now uh, Italy joining with 2.5 million. So we have the basis to do a comprehensive study for the Transaqua project. It's no more a water transfer project. This is a transformation project for economic growth in Africa. So the realization of the Transaqua infrastructure project with the support of partnership of Europe and China will surely launch Africa on the road to economic growth, human security, industrialization, peace, development, and the attainment of the dreams of Pan-African leaders, such as Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah had this dream in 1964. So this partnership, uh, when we start investing it in the next 50 years, Africa will become the new China. Uh, let me just go through some of the slides. These are the roads that will be created. This one in just the first lot in Central African Republic. This is uh, 
what we expect the lecture chart to be. In 2087, you can see the water, the size of the water, unicity. That is the lake not split into different pools that we have now. We have one body of water, and you can see the potential area to be irrigated along the lake chart, around the lake chart in all the countries. That's the one you see in green. We have this strong belief that this will transform Africa. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Mohammed. The next uh, speaker, Mr. Amtsat Bukhari Yabara, who is an historian, he will, uh, he's the general secretary of the Pan-African League, Umoya. He will speak on what Pan-Africanism on the Silk Road, question mark. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I will speak in French. First of all, I would like to thank the Schiller Institute for organizing this international conference, as well as to my comrades with Solidarity and Progress for inviting me. I think this is the second time that we have met here at this location in Germany. For myself, I am a historian and the Secretary General of the Pan-African League Umoja. Umoja means unity in Swahili, an African language. We are a political party operating in some 15 African nations, notably in the two Congos, in the Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, Niger, Senegal, and several other nations, as well as in the African diaspora. That is to say, in France, Belgium, Switzerland, Spain, England, North America, we have supporters in China and Russia as well. We are headquartered in Benin. We are part of the political continuity of Kwame Nkrumah on the model of the United States of Africa to permit Africa to achieve its development by its own means. We seek to achieve local and national power, and to this end, we begin from the standpoint that Africa is at the crossroads of globalization and of balkanization. Africa must liberate itself by following three stages. First, taking local and national power by progressive pan-African forces. Second, the construction of a politically integrated Africa with its own values. And finally, international alliances so that Africa will no longer be the arena for international disorder. So the rela international relations uh, now have several challenges uh, before us. We have the question of ecology, demography. We have the digital uh, revolution. And for us Africans, we have the second phase of decolonization. The first phase was in the uh, 1960s, but we think this has been largely insufficient. So my intervention will be on the resolution, on the equation posed by China to Africa. What Pan-Africanism will have to do on the new Silk Road? First of all, China is not a new actor in Africa. At around 1415, Chinese Admiral Sheng He reached the coast of Africa uh, during the period when the new Silk Road was about, the Silk Road was about to be replaced by the Great Discoveries and the route to the Americas, and during more than five centuries, Africa was forced to open itself to all human and economic predations in the context of slavery and colonization. China shut itself to the outside world before suffering the European and Japanese foreign occupations. And then at the Bandung Conference in 1955, the support for national liberation movements and for the building of the Tanzania-Zambia Railroad showed that China, despite its geographical distance and the difficulties of languages and so on, they didn't wait for other powers to come to 
help the Africans. In the 1960s, several African countries recognized China and supported uh, its return to the United Nations. Rather than running behind Europe or the United States for support, China engaged in self-self cooperation with the Group of 77 or with the BRICS and even contested some of the rules of the WTO. Noteworthy as well is the fact that China has no connection to the structural adjustment policies which caused the collapse of all states and African economies in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, China never followed the Washington Consensus or the IMF or the World Bank directives. However, the project for a new Silk Road policy in Africa brings responses but also poses new questions concerning the Chinese presence. China, of course, defends its uh, interest, uh, whether the West likes it or not. Africa is the last frontier on that road, and the criticism in the Western media against the Chinese presence is more motivated by the decline of Euro-American influence uh, than by the real interest on what, the, what future the Africans will have and how we will be able to recover our sovereignty. The first answer to those questions for Africa is that no development is possible without liberation and a revolution. In Africa, this is a political, economic, cultural, scientific revolution where development is not an ideology but, but a paradigm, the paradigm of unity. Since Chu and Lai, Chinese diplomacy opened spaces in Africa relative to this paradigm of unity. Uh, I would mention the uh, case of Burkina Faso, which just broke with Taiwan, and announced that the projects that Taiwan previously carried out would now be taken over by Beijing. So the principle of Pan-Africanism is based on the principle of a one Africa, one China, one Africa. Now, today, of course, the relations between China and Africa are not equal since China is a continent and a country, and Africa is a country with some 50 states, none of which is equal to China. When China or another actor negotiates with an African country, the Africans have to negotiate having the general interest of Africa in mind. That's the way it should be. In theory, it's up to the African Union to give a collective response. But this institution, whose headquarters were built by China, by the way, has no supranational authority. It has structural weaknesses, such as the fact that it's financed by the West, or that it does not, that it emanates from the sovereignty of the Republic of the African people. China, like Europe and the United States, has an African policy within the context of the Forum for the Chinese Africa Cooperation, but Africa has no Chinese policy, nor a European or a an American policy. It has no solid relations, people to people, company to company, civil society to civil society, and only Pan-Africanism could fill that gap. Now, the second point touches upon the um, reparations for Africa uh, toward those political, military, financial, and other actors who uh, were involved in centuries of slavery and colonization. China is demanding reparations for Japan for the massacres committed during the 1937-45 occupation. The bacteriological experiences, Chinese women who were uh, raped by Japanese soldiers, and so on. Y compris la levée du veto chinois à la demande japonaise pour un siège permanent au Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies. And re Japan long refused to uh, face its own criminal past, but today China has become strong. And the Chinese and the Africans alike, although they suffered from occupation and colonialism, uh, the Western museums, by the way, are full of objects stolen from Africa and from China. And the latter is also an investor today in the African art market. So we need, uh, we have the island of Gore, which uh, was for Euro-African relations. 
For example, the, San, the Senegalese authorities renovated uh, an island which was a slave herding center for several centuries. And the example of China toward Japan shows that the honor of a people lies in the defense of its history and its patrimony. So Africa must also be intransigent with historical truth. China is also part of the African Development Bank and of the Caribbean Development Bank. However, the priority for Africans and Caribbeans is to establish a Pan-African Bank for reparations and reconstruction. Uh, it must be built upon a revolution in the, in the current financial system in which the dollar and the European currency are backed by the military industrial complex of those countries. So we need to have a certain strategy of a definite break. So we really believe that the new Silk Road should not include Europe in its neoliberal and neo-colonial form, it would be un inconceivable for the American civil society to participate in a, an internal an alternative project with forces that had dominated them historically. China is building corridors for its own development. The Westerners control areas for their own stability. But a one belt, one road where Africa sells its resources to China and resells them back to Africa as manufactured products is not equal to equal. It's not a win win partnership. But in that context, what are the markets that Africans can keep in Africa and look forward to gaining in China? I don't see any as long as we do not write into our constitutions our commitment to the transformation in Africa of raw materials into manufactured products in order to build an internal market which will be uh, self-sufficient. As long as Africa will not have uh, will not have an economic revolution, it will never be an equal to equal partner with China, Europe, or the US. We defend a pan Africanist political economy where the rates of growth correspond to real opportunities for the Africans. China is able to mobilize its diaspora, diaspora to uh, avoid calling, appealing for foreign aid, and Africa could uh, take the example of the same model for their financing, rather than charity. Development is a question of interest. The infrastructure projects that China is financing are not the ones that were conceptualized by the Chinese, but by Africans. Several African countries have had plans to develop based on infrastructure construction, roads, bridges, dams, factories. <coughs> We have the uh, Lagos Action Plan of 1980, for example where the African countries were competing between East and West to get material or financial support. Ideology was a tool for development. When the West conditioned aids to uh, liberal governance, China uh, instead showed that the liberal democracy model was not necessary to develop and invest in Africa. Starting in the years 2000, China invested in Africa, responding mainly to the requirements of governments and of the African Union on great infrastructure projects. In reality, those investments remain weak in spite, compared to the rest of Asia or even Europe, but they are enough to transform the situation. The moment China invests in a territory or in a sector which appears insignificant, they give it real importance. Laying out a red carpet treatment, China values even the weakest. The African tours of Chinese officials enhance the African leaders, while those of President Macron are mainly public humiliation sessions. A development plan cannot just finance infrastructures. It is up to the Africans to put the content, content into the envelope. We want infrastructures to serve the people and not the contrary. 
qui seront des nœuds de communication futurs du continent africain. And for the airports and the roads and so on, which will be the um, hubs for the future. des langues, des sciences, des technologies et de l'environnement est également centrale. The question of language, science, technologies, environment are also central. À travers le développement uh, the development of Confucius Institute throughout Africa means we should have a pan-African response via Sheikh Antetiop Institute. À partir de la linguistique et de l'anthropologie, uh, anthropology and philology, uh, inspired by Sheikh Antetiop, who wrote um, the Economic and Cultural Foundations of a Federal State of Black Africa in 1960 already, which called for the economic development of Africa. The teaching of an African language throughout the continent is an objective so that the work language between China and Africa is no longer English or French, but in Af a language from Africa and one of China. So the organization of Shanghai cooperation uh, work in Russian and Chinese, for example. China has been able to modernize its economy while keeping cultural elements which are part of its long history. And Africa has to also maintain this long uh, heritage. Sur la, sur la on technology, China supported the access of Nigeria, and I'm very happy to, to uh, share this podium with people from Nigeria. À travers le financement Le de and uh, China supported the access of Nigeria to space by financing and launching communication satellites. And in exchange, Beijing brought a share in NIG SOMAT, the Nigerian Federal Communications Company. For China, it's a matter of competing with the U.S. and Israel in the communications sector in Africa. For Nigeria, it's a question of training high-level technicians, which could make of that country the first African space power. Avec la mise en place dans les universités africaines, we need dans to les put into place in the uh, African universities un vrai programme um, scientifique a real scientific pan-African pan program. In the 1980s, President Thomas Sankara asked the USSR to train two from Burkina, Burkina Faso to uh, let the country participate in the state space adventure. Sur le dans un pays de and this would also uh, be important for the um, to fight, to fight drought and other environmental problems. Notamment uh, aux it's very important, of course, uh, for agriculture uh, and for demography. The Pan-African Development Project takes into account both uh, industries industrialization and the preservation of the environment in the framework of achieving food self-sufficiency. Uh, capitalism is no response to environmental challenges, and thus the Paris Agreement on Climate is not an agreement for Africa. The principle of peace through environmental cooperation would be a means to rethink the question of resources and of natural spaces. A number of African countries have also launched emergency plans for 2025-2030. Des plans d'émergence favorisera des processus de recolonisation de l'Afrique. And the predictable failure of emergency plans of the past only favored a process of recolonization of Africa. Une révolution organisée. And that will continue as long as the struggles remain politically divided. C'est incontournable et c'est ce qui est en train de se préparer. An organized and disciplined revolution with democratic democratic support. Dans l'État fédéral africain. Is inevitable. Du travail des organisations africaines, des progressistes, qui sont convaincus du caractère. We need the uh, cooperation of African organizations, which are um, unified, united, and political. Et là, les ressources africaines. And in that uh, context, the African resources will be much more important for China than the uh, U.S. Treasury bonds are. So this will be the last frontier of the world competition, but there is a real desire for the peoples to become a real worldwide power.
the responsibility for us is very great. The tasks will demand years of work to get results. But we are already engaged in electoral processes from 2019 to 2021. The Pan-African League is a political movement and we invite all organizations and personalities who are willing to contribute to our work to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bukhari Yabara. And now I call on the Yemeni uh, representative, Mr. Abdullatif Al-Washali, to come to the podium. Oh. Mr. Al-Washali, as we said before, he presents, represents the Yemeni Association Insan for Human Rights and Peace. Thank you. Vielleicht die Folien, aktuelle Lage in Yemen. Ja, vielen Dank. Um, yes, hello. I'm here with uh, my colleague, Mr. Mansour. My name is Elba Shali. I'm here from the uh, Insan Association from Yemen. I'm going to tell you a bit about the situation there. Yemen is a very old country, over 5,000 years of history, a country whose name in history was known as Felix in Arab, of course. And Yemen has about 27, <laughs> nearly 28 million people. 19 point forty six percent is under fifteen years old. The uh, uh, unemployment currently is around sixty percent. It used to be thirty seven percent. The uh, population under the poverty line is five eighty-five percent, and it used to be fifty-four percent. That's the current situation. Uh, now these uh, figures are not the current situation, uh, totally up to date, but they give an idea. Yemen is a country on the Arabian Peninsula uh, island on the southwest corner and it's uh, in, trapped in the strategic triangle of epidemics, war and hunger. For the war, a coalition was formed of 17 countries, and it's led by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. What was the cause of this Krieg uh, war? After the uh, withdrawal of the um, the, the purpose is to try and bring back to power the president who was supported by Saudi Arabia. 
Hadi. Now, after three years of war, the country has been completely destroyed. We have over 36,000 civilian victims over three years. 14,000 died. Infrastructure is largely destroyed. There is a, an air and sea blockade to this day. Economic war is being waged. And the financial situation is uh, marked by the incompetence of the central bank. Salaries cannot be paid for many people. And not only is the, is the income reduced, but the health sector, according to the UN, only 55%, all 55% of the facilities are inoperable or destroyed. And 22 million people are threatened with epidemics and hunger. These are pictures, images of the war. I don't want to scare anyone with these pictures, but I want to people to see how uh, horrendous this war has been. On the first one, you see some children in front of a destroyed school. If you look at the statistics of how many schools and institutions have been destroyed, uh, there are 896 by now which have been completely destroyed in the three years of war. In the next picture, you see a market in Sala, which was destroyed last year in one night. What had this market to do with, uh, with the war? That remains a question mark. Then on the top you see a uh, uh, hospital, which was run by the Doctors Without Borders to help people. And on 6th of August 2016, it was destroyed by an air strike. Many people died or were wounded, including the team of doctors. From the infrastructure standpoint, we could just say that the worst case is now the um, port of Hodaida, which has been bombed many times from the air. But there are also bridges, uh, civilian uh, in facilities. Uh, they were all hit. The humanitarian situation is that 33 million, uh, there have been a great lack of uh, medical supplies and care. The food, of course, is much too scarce. And that's the result of uh, the collapse of the financial situation. That so many facilities have been destroyed. The groundwater supply has collapsed. As we already mentioned, the health system is malfunctioning. 
humanitarian aid is not coming, and the international community has been very reticent to help, to intervene. There are many reasons for this war, but it's claimed that this war It's often claimed that the aggressors want to help the country. But I don't think that anyone here in this conference believes that claim. Therefore, my colleague, uh, Mr. Mansour, will speak about the uh, challenge of peace. Thank you. I also find it, if it's strange that we are the only people speaking German here, although we come from Yemen. My colleague already said, uh, and showed what um, the destructions that have taken place, we would need much more time to describe everything. It's so horrendous. Our families are still there. We're struggling every day. Uh, with this news that we receive on a daily basis. The claim that uh, they want to help Yemen by bringing back uh, the deposed President Hadi, whose term has already run out, or the claim that Saudi Arabia, Arabia um, wants to bring peace back to Yemen is just laughable. This has nothing to do with democracy. And just for three works, just three days ago or so, uh, the women in Saudi Arabia were given the permission to drive. And they are supposed to be, the Saudis are supposed to be defending democracy. To help Yemenis in this way, um, through destruction, through destroying the hospitals and uh, terrifying children, uh, pre preventing them from having an education is just not, not uh, credible. <clears throat> As my colleague showed, 36,000 civilian vi victims and this is the greatest humanitarian crisis of the 21st century, according to the United Nations. Now, the invisible causes of war are also given here. They want to weaken the military, the armed forces, in order to give the political control to the Saudis and indirectly to the Americans. Saudi Arabia has always interfered into Yemeni affairs ever since the beginning in 1934 and again in 1967 and now again. And they won't let the Yemenis, Yemenites themselves decide on their political um, life and who will, who will be elected, who will be the ministers. They want to decide everything who will be the mayor of what town. And since 2015, uh, they lost the possibility to do that, uh, to impose everything from Riyadh. And that's one of the reasons of the war. And the um, the win-win uh, situation, they want to prevent from that from becoming realized. And they want to use the geopolitical situation with the location of Yemen. It's an egoistic way of thinking. There are also major economic interests because uh, on the border between Saudi Arabia and uh, the Red Sea, 
uh, the Yemenis are not allowed to decide for themselves what kind of economic activity should go on. You see here this, this map, and you see how important the role is of the, um, right, where it's uh, located geographically between the Gulf of Aden and the uh, Arab Sea, between Europe and Asia, and we have this Strait of Manga, uh, which has made, which makes it difficult to protect the uh, international commerce and trade. Yemen must not be attacked, and we should not accept that the Emirates and the Saudis uh, are acting like children in this region by trying to impose their rule. What we hope from this conference, or what we would like to be able to do before we can bring uh, Yemen into the New Silk Road, we have a very grave humanitarian crisis. And we need empathy of the international community. And we need to convince Yemen to participate in them. But the Saudis and the Emiratis have to be persuaded to leave the Yemenites alone. The Chinese dipl diplomat who had to leave had a uh, proverb, if you want to become rich, you have to build a street, a road. And we say, if we want Yemen to uh, participate in the international uh, communi community, we have to pull it out of this catastrophe. Therefore, our challenge is for all of us as mankind, someone who has his family here, who eats well, who sleeps well, should think that people in Yemen and in Syria are, are not able to do that. And we should not just observe that, just be onlookers like we did in Syria for so long. We waited too long before intervening in Yemen. And then we felt also threatened. The war must be ended. That is the main uh, criterion for uh, economic interests. We have to consider Yemen as a sovereign country. We need open dialogue for all the political problems. We need a Supreme Court, a constitution, new elections. We need to cope with the catastrophic humanitarian situation. We need to have a reconstruction plan and uh, participate in the reconstruction. That's the general challenge of peace. For example, with the BRICS countries, with China, with Russia, uh, with anyone who defends the economic interest, even if they can't think of the human interest, at least if they think in economic terms, they should build their own peace initiative. We don't have to wait for the UN to react. We have to do something ourselves. Our own, build our own peace initiative. We need an independent, yeah, the media need to provide independent information. 
although the UN declared Yemen to be the worst humanitarian crisis of the 21st century, that is very little covered in the media. And it can be, uh, uh, can create pressure. And we should simply look at what is needed in Yemen, schools, roads, medicine. They need our empathy. We need to react quickly and not wait for the UN to react. That needs to be reported. The reconstruction, <coughs> uh, we can maybe go into that a bit later. Thank you. So I see that uh, some of you are becoming tired, but most of you are still awake. Uh, and that's good because now we have the last presentation by Hussein Askari. This will be tough. We'll be <laughs> we will uh, wake all of you up. This is the positive side from Hussein. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yemen is a is I think the perfect case of turning tragedy into a victory. A victory not only for Yemen or the Yemeni people, but for all mankind. Uh, and I will explain why. Uh, uh, for, the, for three and a half years, as our friends have uh, discussed, the Saudi war on Yemen, uh, backed by Britain, the United States, and France, and other countries, has brought with it many tragedies, but also many ironies. It showed that the apparently weak do not necessarily have to lose in the face of the mighty. Yemenis, while admittedly being the poorest people in the region, have a deep sense of historical identity and a culture that goes back thousands of years into history. They are a proud people with a republican sense of freedom and a rough landscape they have that is very advantageous in defensive warfare. All these factors made them capable of resisting the Saudi coalition backed by some of the most powerful military forces on the planet for more than three years. But that was as a, at a very, very high price, as we have seen. Another irony is that right in the middle of the worst war and humanitarian crisis, some Yemenis, and for the duration of the war, uh, have been studying economics as defined by Lyndon LaRouche and the Schiller Institute in order to figure out how to build a modern economy and avoid the disasters of the past. They also have been studying the new Silk Road and want Yemen to join the Belt and Road Initiative and the BRICS. As I said in my opening remarks uh, earlier, to survive tragedy, you have to look towards the stars, i.e. at the future, and derive inspiration and courage from them to survive the current fight and also pave the way to solving the crisis. Earlier this month, on June 6, a seminar was held in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, right under the ongoing escalation of the war. Can I have the first image? It was held at the headquarters of the Yemeni General Investment Authority uh, where, where the Sana'a declarations were issued. The dec um, I have to explain for you just, um, the man standing to the left is Fuad al-Ghaffari. He is the, uh, now the head of the preparatory committee of the new Silk Road Party in Yemen. And he also is organizing young people uh, to form uh, what he calls a BRICS youth uh, government. And he has been leading the uh, initiative in Yemen to introduce LaRouche's economics uh, and at least one school in Yemen now are preparing to teach LaRouche economics in their, in their schools. Uh, he, uh, unfortunately, he was unable for the third time to attend this conference because the, the, the Sana'a airport is completely blocked. The Saudis and the coalition does not allow anybody to fly in and out except for the UN envoy. Uh, and there's no other way to get out of uh, Yemen. Uh, and then we, 
so th he, he's a, he, he deserves all our respect and encouragement because this is really a really act of courage and defiance in the face of the most horrible war being launched on their country because they say, we are not give up in the face of this. We will develop our intellectual powers to defeat the enemy even, you know, mentally. So because we have a future to fight for. We are not fighting just to survive. We are fighting to have a future. So in that seminar, uh, the, uh, where the declaration, Sana Declaration, uh, adopted an 80-page uh, Schiller Institute report. It's called Operation Felix, Yemen's Reconstruction and Connection to the New Silk Road. I am the main author of the report. Uh, the, uh, the GIA deputy director who was in the picture sitting to the right, uh, engineer Khaled Sharaf Adin, opened the seminar by thanking Helgat Seplarouche, chairman of the Schiller Institute, for her and her organization's relentless support to the Yemeni people. He expressed his full support to the proposals made in the report and stressed that the Yemeni General Investment Agency will work to, on two tracks with the government in Sana'a. One is to translate this report into an action plan for the government, and the other track is to thoroughly study all the infrastructure and financial proposals made in the report in order to launch the reconstruction process as soon as the war of aggression is stopped. Now, the GIA, the Investment Authority, and they helped in this uh, by providing us with all the documents we have needed to, to study the Yemeni economy and also where the, the strong and the, the points of strength and weaknesses. So that was very crucial in making this report. And the other person who helped in this uh, also to, to identify the, out, the, the, uh, the f uh, general frame of the report, the structure is my, my friend and the long friend of the Schiller Institute, Mr. Gregor Alberg from Sweden, an architect. Now the report is in Arabic, I wrote it in Arabic, but if you are lucky you will get the, the latest issue of EIR where we have a 10 page review of the, whole, uh, of the whole reconstruction plan. Now one of the key chapters in my report is on how Yemen's economy was destroyed even before the war was launched in March 2015. Through 30 years of wrong economic policies, mostly under the guidance of the IMF and the World Bank. These policies resulted in Yemen getting the nickname the poorest country in the Middle East. You know, every time you hear the news, Yemen, they say the poorest country in the Middle East. That was the result of these IMF and World Bank policies. The reason I took special care about what happened to the economy and people of Yemen before the war is to warn the policymakers against the pitfalls uh, of the economic and financial method methods that have been dominant in the transatlantic old paradigm and its clients or victims. It's necessary to know these things because the, there is a risk that the same economic methods will come back disguised this time as reconstruction aid. It means that the same enemy will come back from the back door to present to you economic policies will destroy your economy exactly as the war destroyed your economy. Uh, one phenomenon which I describe in this uh, report is called uh, um, the, 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 the reason for the collapse of the Yemeni economy is something which is called the rentier state, which described, and this is the fault of the Yemeni government itself, it's not the fault of the foreigners. It describes a state that rely mostly on, or solely on the export of their easily extracted abundant natural resources in order to import all their needs, with little attention paid to investments in improving domestic productive cap capabilities or educating the population, or building infrastructure. Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, and other OPEC nations generally are good examples of this, and Iran, of course. Uh, but Yemen is an extreme example of this. I'll show you just what the next image, just that you don't uh, get confused. In 1987, Yemen discovered oil. Uh, and in 1986, uh, uh, they discovered oil. American company Hunt Oil discovered the first oil. And then there was a, a massive increase in the production of crude oil. Uh, and although the prices at the time were around 40 barrels, uh, $40 per barrel, uh, they uh, were a, a huge source of income for a poor country. Now before oil, uh, in Yemen in 1961, uh, there was a Republican uh, military coup. Uh, there were Republican forces who overthrew the, the former uh, imam uh, a religious, you know, semi-monarchist 
and uh, these were the Imam was a Zaidi, and this is an irony because the British and the Saudis helped and armed the Zaidis, the Imam, against the Republicans, whom they are now uh, fighting in. So before that, uh, uh, it, after 1961, the Yemeni government under the um, uh, Ibrahim Al Hamdi uh, had five-year development plans which were similar to Egypt. They were Nasserites. They were, support, they were supported by Egypt. And they had a very clear intention to develop the economy uh, by building infrastructure, reforming agriculture, and so on. So, but that was ended in 1978 when Al-Hamdi was assassinated through in collaboration with Saudi Arabia. So what happened in Yemen is that you had, sorry, no, just the one before, is that you had a sharp increase in oil income and the oil prices were also going up in a certain period. So the government abandoned all the development policies and started just selling oil and importing everything. There was no infrastructure built, no... Uh, but suddenly, both the oil prices, and there were two oil shocks after the Asian crisis, 97, the oil price collapsed. Uh, and in 2007, 2008 also because of the financial crisis, the oil price collapsed. So the government was left with no uh, resources. So then they called on the, United, on the IMF and the World Bank. But uh, Yemen's own consumption has increased. It has a pop the population was growing. And that made Yemen a complete hostage to the oil prices and became a net importer, actually, of oil products uh, at the, in 2014. So that was the fault of the Yemeni government. Uh, in 1995, the IMF and the World Bank came to help Yemen solve its financial problems. There were four rounds of so-called five-year structural adjustment programs, and I refer to these in my document. These uh, adjust, uh, uh, structural adjustment programs forced the state to privatize its corporations, lifting state subsidies for food and basic commodities, firing tens of thousands of state employees, opening the domestic market for competing foreign goods through radical free market policies that killed whatever existed of the domestic uh, production. And it's needless to say that these programs, they forbade the state from investing in infrastructure or in industries or in massive agricultural development. So, and even in spite of the dire food situation in the country, especially after the global food price crisis in 2008, Yemen was encouraged to increase the exports of cash generating uh, crops, such as fruits and vegetables, with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries being the main market. With no support, no protection for the domestic cereals productions or grains, farmers moved to cash generating crops, fruits and vegetables, but more seriously into the cat drug, uh, uh, which ex witnessed an explosion in, in that uh, period because of the economic and social uh, crises. I mean, all the, the result of the, all these policies, this is what people call the most, the poorest country in the, in the region. And you can see that between 1990 and, 19, and 2014, all the general indexes of social and economic uh, well-being of society have been collapsing or stagnating. So I'm not going to go through every one of them, but the, the situation just continued to deteriorate. And food imports were, you know, Yemen imported 80% of all its grain uh, before the war. So it is no wonder that as soon as the the Saudi coalition blocked their ports, the famine was a fact. Also, the, the deficit in, in, in food production was increasing. The only thing which was, uh, the deficit was reduced was in the fisheries because Yemen was encouraged to develop its fisheries, but it was export directed. And also, this is a very <laughs> fascinating picture. This is agricultural area in Yemen between 1961 and 2015. Now, just to go back to this, the IMF policy, but I'm, the reason we are saying this is because this was experienced in most countries in Africa and South America and many Asian countries who were subjected to the... But this is a fascinating picture that agricultural area in Yemen did not increase from 1961 to 2015. 
and the Yemen permanent crops did not increase either. And all this is the cereals uh, production. Actually, it decreased with the level it was in, 2000, in 1961. So anyway, we go directly to the uh, how to reverse this policy. Uh, and we could say, as, as our friend said, that the Republic of Yemen enjoys a unique geographical position at the intersection point of the land-based economic belt of the, the, of the new Silk Road and the maritime Silk Road of the 21st century, the red and the yellow. Uh, thus becoming a key component of this giant de development project and benefiting from it at the same time. Yemen played a similar role in the ancient history when it, was, it had mastered the roots of trade, which were called the incense and the gum roots. And many powerful nations from east and west were setting sail and camel caravans in its direction, seeking trade and exchange of knowledge. The reason I call, I call it Operation Felix is that the ancient Greeks and later the Romans called Yemen Arabia Felix, means happy Arabia, because it was known to be a prosperous and happy nation. Today, Yemen enjoys great human resources. Have the next. Uh, this is the, um, the chart of population growth. It's uh, quite uh, phenomenal. Between 1965, from uh, 5 million to in 2005, it was uh, 24 mi million. Now it's 27 million, as our friends see. So this is a, 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 a very a sharp increase in the population. But the interesting thing is that the, uh, is the, the age pyramid, uh, which is... Uh, the lowest is the, 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 the youngest uh, of the population, and then you have the age uh, ascending there. Um, you know, as, as you see in the uh, population pyramid, it, has, it shows that the, the median age of Yemen today is 19.2 years. That's the average age of the Yemenis. Uh, that was in 2015, and it is projected to be 29 years by 2050. Now, in comparison, I looked yesterday at Germany's median age, and it's 46 years. The average German is 46 years, and maybe some people should have to reconsider the refugee crisis or change the, the cultural and economic policies to solve it. By 2045, Germany will have a median age of 50 if they are lucky. Uh, uh, Yemen has also uh, abundant natural resources and a diverse climate that makes it suitable for integrated agro-industrial development. What is lacking in Yemen, though, like in Af many parts of Africa, is what Lyndon LaRouche calls the economic platform, the platform of basic infrastructure to lift all these resources to higher levels of productivity and to bring into being their potential. Now, I'm not going to go through the details because we, uh, we propose that the president of Yemen goes on TV, this is what I say in the report, and declare that Yemen has a, a national reconstruction plan based on these, uh, but also it has to announce that Yemen will establish its no, its, uh, a, a national credit uh, facility, a national reconstruction and development bank, which could issue sovereign credit with the backing of other, uh, other nations like China, uh, but Yemen has to become completely independent and, uh, and sovereign, have its sovereign currency to issue the credit necessary for doing the work that could be done within, within Yemen. I'm not going to go through that uh, uh, because it's, it's too much details. You can read it in the, and we don't have enough time. But also the, uh, the other ad the, uh, additional source of financing for the reconstruction process and the development projects, especially ones requiring foreign technology, machinery, and involvement of foreign companies, is through export credits uh, with the nations whose corporations participate or in or export necessary materials and technology for the development projects. One very good example, which uh, we include in the report, is, the, is from Yemen itself. In 2013, China and Yemen uh, made an agreement to finance the Aden Container Terminal expansion projects, to expand the Aden uh, port, especially the container ter terminal. 
The project, which was planned to be carried out by a Chinese company, costing $500 million dollars, U.S. dollars, was to be financed through a loan extended by the China Export-Import Bank to the Yemeni government. Uh, so China would finance the project, Chinese companies will build the project, and then they will deliver it to the Yemeni Ports Authority. So the Chinese will not own the facility, and Yemen will run the port and pay back the loan to China over a very long uh, uh, period. However, the project was not carried out due to the deterioration of the security and political situation in 2014. Uh, the project was intended to make the Aden Container Terminal one of the largest ports in the western part of the Indian Ocean. The agreement was signed in November 2013, one month after President Xi Jinping launched the concept of the maritime Silk Road of the 21st century, which would make Aden and the other Yemeni ports a key component of the maritime Silk Road. So the, uh, the key component in the development plan uh, proposed in this report is the construction of the Yemeni development corridor, or corridors, modeled on LaRouche's concept of the development corridor. Now when you look at our maps of the Silk Road or the World Land Bridge, uh, you see all these lines crossing the continents. These are not just a railway or a camel caravan carrying goods from the east to the west. These are con the concept is to build what we call, develop, or LaRouche calls, the development corridor, which is 100 to 150 kilometers wide. This is a, a cross-section of it, which includes railways, uh, roads, water canals, oil and gas pipelines, power lines, nuclear-powered new cities and agro-industrial agro centers. So this should be the, this is the concept that will stretch from the east to the west, opening new areas with potential development, but they need these tools to be able to raise the potential which exists in their, in their countries. The, the, the report conceptualizes the Yemeni development corridors with the uh, main spine um, extending from Sada to Aden. This is the main, we call it the spine or the backbone. And then you have the limbs going to the port cities but also to the plateau, which is very, has a, a great potential for development, but also along the coast, which will benefit from the Maritime Silk Road. So there were three factors were considered in defining the roots of this corridor. First, the current distribution of the population density the, most of the Yemeni population live in the, the Yemeni plateau, which, uh, in the mountain areas. So this is, in the, in the first uh, stage, this is, would be important to serve uh, the community there. And then we have also the agricultural activities happen to be also in the same, on, fall in the same corridor. These are the existing, what is exi the existing resources. And then even the rainfall map shows the concentration of rainfall and water resources in the same region. And then we have the mineral resources of Yemen. These are the industrial mineral resources, which also fall in the same line with the proposed uh, corridors. Now, uh, we start from the existing resources, then we expand into the, through the economic platform to open new areas of Yemen uh, for development and demographic expansion because you cannot have the, the population concentrated only where you have these uh, previously existing resources. So as we say, so we need to have an expansion, the demo demographic and economic activity to the, to the coast areas with the Hodeida port, the Mocha port, and also into this uh, plateau especially with agricultural activity, because most of the agriculture in the highlands is concentrated on uh, food, uh, fruits um, uh, and vegetables. Uh, it's a very ter tough area to grow uh, grains, for example. So therefore now there are plans actually already to move the grain production into these areas and to these areas, but you need to develop the water resources to, to make it possible. Uh, 
And then the third concentration is that Yemen should be connected to the Belt and Road, um, to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it, will, it will be connected to the Belt and Road, the, to the land part of the Belt and Road through projects connecting to Oman and across the Hormuz Strait to Iran and further to Central Asia, but also to, to Russia. Uh, and also uh, there is a proposal for a bridge or a tunnel across the Bab el um, Strait to connect to Djibouti, Ethiopia, and the rest of Africa. Now, in the future, of course, if there will be peace, this does not exclude the fact that Yemen is connected to the rest of West Asia with Saudi Arabia, with the Gulf countries, and so on and so forth, to Europe. But at the moment, the perspective for doing that immediately is not there. But th it's very important to, that in the future that the Yemenis and the Saudis are reconciled. Now, many tribes uh, on the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, I mean, they're I, nationality is not really identified. They, they, they are Saudis or Yemenis. Nobody knows if they are Saudis or Yemenis. Therefore, the, the, the borders of Yemen with Saudi Arabia have not been really demarcated. So the people in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, they share, you know, even in a tribal sense, they, they share a common uh, destiny. Uh, so anyway, I mean, we, we refer in the report to the tremendous developments that are taking place in, um, in, in Africa, thanks to the Belt and Road Initiative. But also this means that Yemen could benefit massively by being a transport and logistics hub, but also uh, considering East, uh, East Africa as a major market for developed uh, Yemeni uh, products. Um, now, we also, in order to give people an idea, the policymakers in Yemen, an idea about the cost, the difficulties, the, the technical aspects which they will face in building these uh, infrastructure develops, uh, infrastructure projects, we picked, uh, we took one example from Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the Mekele Awa, uh, Weldeya Awash Railway. It's being constructed now partially by Austrian, Turkish companies, but also by Chinese companies. It's two sections. And this is a topographical map of the Horn of Africa and Yemen. And this shows that, you know, the, the greener you go, it's the lower, close to the sea level, and the, the brighter is the higher altitude. So this railway, it goes from 800 meters above sea level to 2,800 meters above sea level. So there are enormous difficulties, and I describe in detail how many tunnels, there are 30 tunnels built, 60 bridges, uh, culverts, all kinds of things. It's strikingly very close, both uh, demographically, but also the topography is very close to the Saada Adan project. Uh, and therefore we are trying to give an approximation already now for people to consider the cost, the difficulties, and how it is being uh, constructed, and also to draw um, uh, inspiration from these projects, that these things are possible to do. Anyway, in conclusion, I would just like to say that in the uh, June 6th seminar uh, in, in, um, in Sana'a, which I described earlier, I propose that the government uh, there uh, adopts this plan as a key component in any peace and reconciliation uh, talks between the different Yemeni beleaguerant parties and to be, to, that this would be agreed upon before that this would be the mission of the future Yemeni government that everybody agrees that this is what we want to do when we have peace. Not to have peace as I, I say in the report we don't want to reconstruct Yemen to what it was before the war because before the war as we remember it, Yemen was the poorest country in the region so it's not our intention to bring Yemen back to what it was. We want to transform Yemen into the future. In the same time, it, <laughs> thank you. In the same time, it's a, a means uh, of motivating the international community to consider the absurdity of the continuation of this war and the fact that the people controlling the government in Sana'a are not mere militias with power ambitions, but are statesmen with visions and knowledge. 
The responsibility to stop this genocidal war is, is upon every individual and every government in the world today. The vision for launching a genuine reconstruction and development plan in Yemen is in harmony with the new paradigm of cooperation in the world as expressed in this conference so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hussein. We all hope that this terrible war and the sufferings of the Yemeni people uh, end as soon as possible, that they join the tremendous progress process which is going on in Africa, which has been partially highlighted by our speakers today. So now I think we have time for discussion. I believe until six o'clock, if the organizers can confirm this. Uh, but before opening the floor to the many questions, which you certainly have, I would like to have to, to make two announcements. The first one concerns a speaker who was planned to come tomorrow uh, and, and unfortunately couldn't come, uh, but he sent, it, he sent his greetings and I think uh, uh, since I'm on the podium today and not tomorrow, I will uh, read it now, it's 30 seconds. It will also be 30 seconds of Italian lesson in Italian. <laughs> but I will translate it. This is Professor Geraci, Michele Geraci, who is an expert of China, he's an economist, he has uh, been working and living in China for 10 years, and I made his acquaintance one year ago, uh, and uh, he was uh, very enthusiastic when I invited him to the Schiller Institute conference, uh, he was eager to come, but then happened something which is, uh, a great fortune, but also a misfortune. He was called in the Italian government, so he's now a member of the government. And uh, <laughs> it's a fortune for him and for my country, but, uh, and for, uh, for the world, uh, a misfortune for this conference, because he cannot come. Uh, but before um, uh, I read his, uh, his uh, short greetings, uh, let me tell you that he, as soon as he uh, went to Rome and took office, he is now State Secretary, uh, Under Secretary uh, to the Economic Ministry, which is Economic Development Ministry, which is Industry, Foreign Trade, uh, Foreign Trade, Fishery, Tourism, uh, and maybe something else. And he will be uh, <coughs> will be responsible for foreign trade. So he has already an idea, which he laid out in an interview yesterday which freaked out everybody because uh, the second thing he said is that his first priority will be to engage in cooperation with China to develop Africa because that's the, that's the answer. <laughs> the answer to the migration crisis. The first thing he said which freaked out everybody is that concerns the uh, the national air company, Alitalia, which is in a crisis. So the previous government uh, tried to sell it to anyone and uh, it looks like that uh, uh, Lufthansa is interested. So he, he came in and said, why should we sell it to our German competitors? Uh, let's sell it to the Chinese, <laughs> so everybody. <laughs> and so, um, he gave me uh, a short message on, on uh, WeChat. It's really 30 seconds, and I will just play it for you. So, there it is. You can say that I was invited before the nomination, and I was programming to participate, and then, in addition to the nomination, of course, the institutions of institutional government do not consent, unfortunately, to be there, and I hope to be a success at the conference, and that it is interesting to know the content of the interviews, the results, and send me too. This can be said with pleasure. I think you understood everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so nomina, <laughs> successo, <laughs> uh, and of course the, the commitments he has for his new job, for, for which we wish him also a lot of success. Uh, the second announcement that I want to, uh, actually, uh, Odile, you should give the announcement because it concerns a new French publication, right? The land bridge in French language. Please, can you say what it is? So 
Oh, yes, I think it is an appropriate place and the appropriate uh, moment to announce that the French uh, version of the Land Bridge Report is in preparation. It's not yet ready, but uh, we intend to publish it uh, beginning of September. And uh, if you want to, if you are interested to, to uh, already, uh, you know, get a subscription to this uh, report, uh, you can go to the table. We have the announcement, uh, which is uh, ready. Uh, so just um, keep following, and it will come uh, in September. So and now the floor is open for questions. Here to me. I have one question, please. Uh, you mentioned Yemen. Uh Mr. Reichmann, I know you, but can you identify yourself for the audience? Yeah, my, my name is Paul Reichmann. Uh, I have one question regarding the speech before about Yemen. Uh, you mentioned that the population was exploding from 4 million to 28 million and the industrialization was going down to zero, was deindustrialized. On the other side, Saudi, a country like Saudi is one of the richest countries in the world. So if you need capital for industrialization, it should be a paradise situation. So if you have exploding population, and you need industrialization. What do you think is the reason that the richest countries in the world, in the Middle East, are the least industrialized countries by their own effort? Thank you. I, uh, first of all, I didn't say the population was exploding uh, because it's, for me it's not a negative thing. The population was uh, increasing, um, uh, you know, with e extreme speed. Uh, but uh, I consider that as a good sign because, you know, you had the infant mortality rates uh, decreasing, you know, especially after World War II because you have vaccination, you have other means to protect life. Uh, but uh, so I consider in increase of population as a resource. It's not a problem. Now, the other thing is that there is a general policy is like nations who are, you know, wealthy in natural resources that they will be, they continue being dependent on the, these resources. Because in, in the discussion we have, and the report itself too, and also in our previous report, uh, in the World Land Bridge, the Arabic version, we encourage nations who are exporters of uh, oil to decrease that and ad uh, heed the advice of Lyndon LaRouche, which he made in Abu Dhabi in 2002, where he said you should build nuclear power and then oil and gas you should use not for burning, which is very stupid, but to use it as an industrial raw material where you can uh, produce petrochemicals, plastics, chemicals, fertilizers with a much, much, much greater value. Um, and the the reason that these nations are kept as oil exporters and not as industrial nations is because, first of all, that the flow of oil, which most of the world nations depend on, and now more increasingly, China, Japan, South Korea, India, are very dependent on the oil going from the Gulf. Now, this is an irony because most people think that the oil from the Gulf goes to the United States. It's not true. 90% goes to Asia, to the, um, to the Asian giants. Uh, and that can be used as a blackmail against China and against uh, Japan and other countries. Uh, the other reason is, uh, is that the, the, uh, the financial resources from the oil will not be invested in these countries in building infrastructure, uh, industry or agriculture. These, this money will be invested in the, in the markets in London and in New York. So there has been a very co uh, 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 conscious uh, policy that these oil exporting countries will not build infrastructure, they will be exporting their, the dollars back to London and New York to be invested there and used in the transatlantic powers uh, interest um, and also that there will be no development. Also the, the political systems in these countries have to be kept in a primitive tribal 
systems. There is no uh, democratic or you know, political freedoms that uh, doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia. But these countries will be kept protected by American arms or British arms and British intelligence. Uh, so they've become completely dependent for the rest of history on the superpowers. And that's why maybe I'd, that answers your question. Yes. Just a second. Just before your question, I would like to have Mr. Christantopoulos. You wanted to say something? You have a question? Yes, please. And then afterwards, the lady. My name is uh, Christantopoulos. I would just I have one question. When uh, hearing uh, the news about the situation in Yemen, uh, the Saudis and other countries uh, are speaking about the Houthis who are sending, uh, who are sending uh, the missiles into Saudi Arabia, etc. I didn't hear anything about them today. And what is their relation with the authorities of uh, Sana'a? That's what I would like to know. Thank you. Well, it's obvious that the Houthis or Ansarullah are the main power in, uh, in Yemen, but there is also a, a, the, the mass media is also trying to mislead everybody uh, that it was this fanatic group who, who are working for Iran, because both of them are Shia, um, are, are trying to destabilize Saudi Arabia and the other U.S. allies and the Sunni states, which is not completely true. I mean, the Houthis did take power in Sana'a, but that was to prevent a, a, big, a much bigger disaster uh, because the country was uh, about to be divided into six pieces according to the Gulf Council uh, uh, peace, so-called peace and uh, reconciliation plan. Uh, but in, in Yemen, I mean, the reason that the, the Yemen could resist all this time it does not because of the, the Houthis. The Houthis are a minority in the country. The, uh, nobody talks about the Yemeni National Army which joined them and also the, the, the largest political party in Yemen, the, uh, the Popular Congress Party of the former Ali, President Ali Abdel Salah also joined the, the Ansarullah in forming a coalition government. So these facts are not being mentioned in order to give the impression that this is just a militia, they are Iranian agents, and they want to destroy Yemen, kill the Sunnis, and you know, destroy Saudi Arabia. I mean, they have no means of doing any of these. And nobody has proven that they are working for Iran or Iran is sending weapons because, I mean, you can't even t send pills, medicines to Yemen without the ships being checked a hundred times. So how could the Iranians send missiles to, to Yemen passing through all this enormous blockade? So yes, the Houthis and Sarullah, they are the main uh, controlling power, but they are not alone. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to resist. And the more crimes are committed by the Saudi co coalition, more people are supporting them. Like what we saw in Hodeida, young people were volunteering from different parts of the country to go to fight in Hodeida against the, uh, the Hodeida port against the Saudis. So yes, it's true, they are a factor, but that's not the whole story. Elsa Vumi, présidente de l'association Congo Actif. Alors, je voudrais poser une question euh, à M. Ascari. Oui. Alors, dans vos premiers slides, dans vos premiers slides, vous avez... Uh, a question for Mr. Ascari. You have shown the first slide, uh, Afrique in blackness and another one, another picture with the light all around Africa and all, the, all your introduction. When Jean-Louis Borloo have promoted the project to put light in Africa, a, a lot of African head of states uh, was agree with this uh, project of the Jean-Louis Borloo, the French former minister. Are you in direct uh, contact with this kind of project? Is it the same project? It's just my, it is my first question. 
And uh, just a second question for the Nigerian uh, representative. Can you tell us about the Congo Basin, Mr. the expert? What is the part of the Congo Basin which is inside the Democratic Republic of Congo? And which are the countries which are really concerned by the what you call the Congo Basin? Because I have not really heard about the Republic Democratic of Congo. I'm not an expert, but I think that 50% of this basin is more than 50% of the basin of the Congo is inside the RDC. And your slide, and you have this red dot blue line between the Chad Basin and the Congo Basin. It was near the Victoria Falls. Instead of in the middle of the east of Congo, where you have this war, this economic war, the of low intensity since 1993, I repeat it, what we call hell on earth. Is, is worse than what Hitler did. Of course, we are not uh, in the mass media as in the Yemen, but is is a genocide. What I have heard for the Yemen reconstruction, there is no peace in the Republic Democratic of Congo. And I'm very uh, there is in the eight states you mentioned, uh, there was no the Republic Democratic of Congo. So please give me more details about the participation of the Republic Democratic of Congo for this project, because we are talking about sovereignty, respect of sovereignty, respect of the population, win-win, win-win cooperation. So, so are you in favor of uh, the Czech on job project? And our, our parents, we, 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 which are working with Nkrumah in Pan-Africanism. Are you are in this direction, this philosophy? Are you as African? For us, Congolese, are you in the British tradition? With the Rwanda, Luganda? And is a strategy of balkanization of uh, this region, a balkanization of the region. We know that everybody wants that. There is a lot of project already. Uh, uh, we have not mentioned the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I was just given a message that the orchestra needs to rehearse in this room as soon as possible. Uh, it's six o'clock already, so I think we should take one more question. Since a gentleman who wants to raise a question, are you happy with her question or do you want to raise your question? You want to ask your question? Do it please, quick, so that our okay. guests can... <laughs> Posez votre question maintenant. Je suis... I'm working with the uh, Pan-Africanist movement of uh, the Republic Democratic of Congo, so... This project of a live chat is, uh, we are for it because it's a Pan-African project, but there is a problem, a very big problem, because the Congo Basin, 80, 90% of this basin is inside the Democratic Republic of Rosso, so the population is concerned. But now, the Congolese people living this low intensity war in this process of balkanization. So all these projects have to be discussed with, with them. It's like they are losing their uh, territory. So you have to make vulgarization of this project. What in, is inside the box? Please tell us how the Congolese, Congolese people are engaged in this kind of project. But because if the Congolese people are not engaged in this project, behind this project, it will not succeed. The ball is in your side. We are ready. We are Congolese. We are ready. Please contact us.
Yeah, uh, short answer. Uh, no, I have no idea about the French uh, project to electrify Africa. I wish that was true. Maybe uh, my friends in France can answer that question. But we looked at other project, which is called Power Africa, which the Obama administration uh, launched uh, in 2009. And it was a big joke uh, because it will keep all, it will keep Africa dark in the night basically but you can take a look at it yourself the power africa projects what we are talking about is a thousand times larger than what the obama administration was proposing and therefore the what you saw in the image i presented from 2050 is uh, i asked my friend uh, chance mcgee if we if we implement all these projects we have in this report which we are proposing uh not only we are not just writing about the projects which are being built we are talking about how Africa will be in 2050 what is necessary uh, to be done in Africa in general lines and that was the result if we do all these projects and if we are successful then we will be able to to have that beautiful picture of Africa by night so if you want to know how that will achieve take a buy a copy of this report No? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, mes amis, madame, uh, and the other guy for the questions. Right now, we don't have a project on the ground. It's just a proposal. And the good thing about it is that the Abuja conference said, okay, before you even start discussing to the countries of the SICOS, SICOS is the equivalent of the LCBC or the Commission de Basin du Lac Chat. Before you even go to the SICOS countries, you need to design do the uh, feasibility study, see whether it is feasible to do it before you take it to the Congo people. So right now, there is nothing on the ground. I have seen in the news, people are making several uh, uh, statements that this project is going on without consulting the people of the Congo. Nothing has been, been decided. It is the Congo people that will decide. The DRC people, the Congo Brazzaville people, the Angolans, because these are the countries that make up the Congo Basin. They make up the Seacoast. It is them that will decide that we want this win-win situation for Africa. The African Union has given its own endorsement of the project. So we want to get the study done. Within three years, we'll have the study. Then we will now consult all the people in the Congo Basin. How do we implement this to save your neighbors in the Sahel, to save Africa, but most important thing, to share the benefits of the waters of the Congo with the whole of Africa for the transformation of Africa. This is where we are. In addition, of course, it, it's still in the conceptual stages. But in addition, uh, my understanding is that uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo has an observer status in the Lake Chad Raising Commission. At least it's keeping abreast of what, what goes on there. And then there's the, uh, the International Commission of the Congo, Wibangi, uh, Sangha Basin. I understand that they also participated in, uh, in, in the conference. So uh, Congo is fully involved. There's nothing that would happen without the De Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as all the other uh, uh, countries that would be affected by this project. And lastly, I would say that um, we, I, I still want to emphasize, you know, um, 
not just the Chinese, but also the European participation in projects such as uh, these. What we need uh, in the world we live in today is less Frontex, less Frontex, more Interreg. Interreg is, is, is there to, uh, to, 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 that it can be used as a resource for planning these sort of uh, projects in Africa and, and, and other places. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope uh, we could uh, continue the discussion tomorrow also uh, because the speakers, I believe, will uh, stay at the conference tomorrow. So will, there will be a discussion on the next panel tomorrow, but I, I think it will be possible also to address the issues we have uh, uh, spoken about today. So this, um, this would be not a, a, a classical closure without the last two announcements. The first one is that you will find this newest, the second new edition of the Land Bridge Report outside if you want to look at it and buy it um, and support the Schiller Institute. And uh, I would like to join uh, the call by my friend Jacques Cheminade, which he did today. It's a good thing that in a situation where there are conflicts between France and Italy, an Italian and a Frenchman agree on something, and I fully agree with this call to uh, join us and become members of the Schiller Institute in order to help us to implement uh, the things which we have discussed today. So I think that's it. So we have to leave the room. Uh, please leave the room as soon as possible for the orchestra to come in and rehearse for the concert. The concert will start at 8 o'clock. <laughs>